every year as I'm looking forward to the Fatima conference, I think this year I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation. And sometimes I'm not as technologically savvy as some of the other priests and speakers, but uh, I think I'll have the time to do it and never seem to have the time. So I hope you can bear with me with a simple lecture. And I also want to mention that a lot of this may be overlapping what you heard in the first lecture. And you may be wondering why, if you looked at your program, we have three lectures today on Vatican II. So even though there may be some overlapping, I think it's very important, especially because our younger generation, you hear the word Vatican II and don't really know what that means, what it was. And even some in the older generation don't know enough about Vatican II. And also, we are hitting it from several different angles this morning. Father Francisco Radecki spoke about the masterminds behind Vatican II, who was really behind the new teachings. This lecture is going to focus on what Vatican II taught specifically that was wrong. And then Father Oswald will follow with a third lecture this morning on how has Vatican II been applied on the local level, in the parishes, etc., and as I said, we are hitting it uh, from these three different standpoints or topics because today is the 50th anniversary of the beginning of Vatican Council II. So consequently, in the modern church, they're celebrating 50 years of this wonderful council and they fail to admit, they will not admit that it was in any way misguided, even though the devastation that Vatican II brought about is there for anyone to see who has eyes to see. But they still will not admit it. Just yesterday, in his Wednesday, his weekly audience, Benedict XVI praised Vatican II. So these modernists cannot bring themselves to say it was misguided, it was wrong in any way. They continue to praise it and to say, the solution we need is to live it better. Uh, it's not being followed as it should and so forth. So... We want to take an honest and um, truthful look at Vatican II, what it was, what it taught. Vatican II, of course, was a general council, also called an ecumenical council, which means it is not just bishops of one country or one area, but bishops from all over the world united under the authority of the Pope. That doesn't mean a Pope is personally present. Often general councils were conducted by the Pope's legates, the Pope's representatives. That was the case in the Council of Trent. Trent is a city in northern Italy, close to Venice. The Pope didn't go there, but he had cardinals whom he appointed and he was in close contact with throughout the sessions. So Vatican II then is, was one of these general councils where bishops from all over the world were called to gather at the Vatican in Rome. Councils are named according to the city where they are held or sometimes the building where they are held. So you had councils in cities in the east like Nicaea, Constantinople, Chalcedon, Ephesus. Uh, you had the five councils of the Lateran. The Lateran is a basilica in Rome, St. John Lateran. And then, of course, the Vatican is the basilica where St. Peter's uh, the Basilica of St. Peter's in Rome. So that is how it gets its name. It is called Vatican II because there was a true council at the Vatican in 1869 to 1870 under Pope Pius IX, which defined the dogma of the infallibility of the Pope and of the Church and uh, condemned heresies that were existent at that time and taught other things. So that is how a council gets its name. Now there have been, as Father Francisco Radecki pointed out earlier this morning, there have been illegitimate councils in the church in the past that were condemned by popes. They were not called by a true pope. They were maybe a, a council of a group of heretical bishops that tried to foist their teachings on the church and they were condemned. Perhaps the best known was the Second Council of Ephesus in 449 which was called Latrocinium, the robber council. So it is not anything new that there was a false council. What is new is that it was called by the man who was supposedly the Pope, and it was uh, 
attended by bishops from all over the world. There have been 20 true general councils of the church. Again, the last one, the Vatican Council, or Vatican I, as we now call it, in 1869 to 1870, and the most famous of all being the Council of Trent, which started in 1545 and did not conclude until 1563, 18 years later. That doesn't mean it was in continual uh, session during that time, because when the Pope dies, the Council is suspended until a new Pope is elected and until he calls it to reassemble. And that's why it took the Council of Trent so many years to be completed. The purpose of this lecture is twofold. I hope to be able to demonstrate to you, first of all, what Vatican II was, a general overview, and that it was heretical. And then second, to demonstrate that because it was heretical, it is the problem that the church faces today. In other words, all of the errors that we see that have infected the church meaning the, the members of the church, and led them astray, all of the devastation that has been caused. And it's hard for our younger generations to realize this, but the older generation can remember a time when you could go to any church that had the word Catholic outside the church. The Mass was always the same. There were schools, seminaries everywhere. It was, it was common to see nuns, for instance, in the public sphere, walking down the street in a store or whatever. The Catholic Church was very vibrant. And Vatican II brought this utter devastation to the institutions of the church throughout the world. And as I, re as I said, I, and I repeat, Vatican II is the problem. It's not, as I have heard this so often from conservatives in the Novus Ordo Church, well, the problem is the liberal priests who have misunderstood Vatican II and the modern progressive bishops, they're misapplying it. What we really need to do is go back and read Vatican II and live what it says. And so I, what I want to impress upon you is, no, that's not the case. It is the documents themselves that are heretical. Vatican II is the problem. It is not a misinterpretation of the council that is our problem. The council itself was heretical, erroneous. It was evil. It is from the devil. And it's not the interpretation. It is the council itself that must be thrown out and is the source of all these problems. That is my primary goal to, uh, to lead to that conclusion. When John the 23rd called the council, he announced the council in a meeting of the cardinals on January 25th, 1959, only 90 days after he had been elected. This is incredible. This is unheard of. And of course, normally, when a pope calls a council, he will speak to his advisors about the need, what, what do they think. And it was a bombshell to the cardinals that there is going to be a council. The interesting thing is that prominent Freemasons had been asking for a council for a hundred years. I remember the words of one Mason. He said, we need a pope to call a council to, con to consecrate to use his words, to consecrate ecumenism. So the Freemasons wanted a council. This would be a way of them spreading these modernist ideas throughout the clergy and throughout the world. So again, John the 23rd shocked the, count, the cardinals by announcing this, and so soon after his election. And then one of the cardinals said, what are we to expect from the council? What will be its purpose? He walked over to the window, opened the window, and he said, we're going to let some fresh air into the church in order to blow away the dust that has accumulated in the church since the time of Constantine. Now, interestingly, John the Twenty-Third also said that the council was not going to be a dogmatic council. It would be pastoral. So it was going to be very different from any previous council. Councils were called to condemn heresy. Now I want you to listen to the words of John the 23rd in his opening talk on October 11th, 1962 at Vatican II. This is what he said, among other things. Quote, The church has always been opposed to these errors, speaking of the false ideas of men. 
She has often condemned them with the greatest severity. Now, however, the spouse of Christ prefers to employ the medicine of mercy rather than that of harshness. She is going to meet today's needs by demonstrating the validity of her doctrine rather than by renewing condemnations. Translation, we're not going to have any condemnation of error at Vatican II. We're just simply going to try and promote the truth. Well, let me ask the parents this. How do you think it would work with your children if you never corrected them for anything they did wrong? And you only talked about, praised them for the things they, they did well. You never corrected them for anything they did wrong. How do you think they would turn out? And if you look at the history of the church, the church has always had to condemn heresy. And that brings the truth out more clearly by the condemnation of heresy. So right from the first day, John the 23rd leaned over, I'm sorry, John the 23rd said that we're not going to condemn heresy, and I believe it was at that, that opening speech that Cardinal Ottaviani leaned over to a cardinal next to him and he said, I pray God that I die before this council is over. That way I know I'll die a Catholic. And that, to me, is an amazing quote from a great warrior of the faith, Cardinal Ottaviani. Again, the council began on October 11, 1962, 50 years ago today. It had four sessions, October, November, December, roughly nine or ten weeks each year, beginning in 1962 and concluding in 1965. During the course of those sessions, there were 16 documents that were uh, promulgated by the council, and all of them promulgated, published, uh, signed, and approved by Paul VI. Because John XXIII, who had called the council, died in June of 1963 before any of the documents had been uh, formally promulgated. So Paul VI, even though John XXIII called it, Paul VI is primarily the one responsible for the approval of Vatican II. Now, Father Francisco Radecki talked a lot about the masterminds behind it, these modernists who were promoting their, their ideas at the Council. There's a very interesting fact that I want you to remember, and that is that John XXIII, when the Council had been announced, appointed a commission of cardinals, bishops, theologians, monsignors, a group of men, I don't know how many, 10 to 20 probably, not a huge number, but a commission. Their purpose was to prepare the preparatory documents. We call them the schema. And the schema would be these documents that the council then would debate and maybe commissions would be appointed to revise certain sections and then they would vote on them. And I read part of an autobiography of a cardinal who was on that commission. And this is what he said. He said, we, the members of the commission, the official commission, we wrote to all the bishops of the world and we asked them, what do you want to be brought up at the council? What do you believe needs to be defined, needs to be explained, needs to be decided upon? And they gathered all of these replies and then they wrote their preparatory documents. And this priest, I, he became a cardinal, but I think at the time he was on the commission, he was a bishop or maybe a priest, not a bishop yet. And he said, when Vatican II started, all of that work for three and a half years of the official commission was thrown in the trash, and all of a the sudden there were brought out these new documents that none of the members of the official commission knew anything about. Where did they come from? Who wrote them? And so isn't that very interesting? The official commission got all of these replies from the bishops. All of that was trashed. And they brought out these documents that these Pariti, these modernist theologians, had prepared in secret. And that is what became uh, the documents of Vatican II. As I said, the Masons had long dreamed of a general council. And there was a prominent Freemason who actually was a good friend of John the Twenty-Third. John the 23rd is Cardinal 
Angelo Roncalli had been the papal uh, legate to France, and he lived in Paris. Well, this prominent Freemason, Mar Sudan, also lived in Paris and was a close friend of John the Twenty-Third. And when the council started, he made the statement, he said, with all our hearts, we wish for the success of John the Twenty-Third's revolution. An interesting perspective from a Mason. Now, before I get into the documents themselves of Vatican II, I would like to give you several points on the overall tone of the council, the overall uh, atmosphere, you might say, of the council. First thing I want to mention is that it only takes one heresy for us to say this entire council was bogus, it was a false council, it was illegitimate, it was not of God. All it would take was it would be one heresy. And yet, Vatican II is filled with doctrinal errors. But this is one of my favorite quotes. This is Pope Leo XIII in the 1800s in his encyclical, Sadis Cognitum. And he says, There can be nothing more dangerous than those heretics who admit nearly, all, uh, nearly the whole series of doctrine, and yet by one word, as with a drop of poison, taint the real and simple faith taught by our Lord and handed down by apostolic tradition. So what is he saying? Be wary of those who speak the truth most of the time, but then every now and then there's this little drop of poison, this little error. And so you can't say, well, 95% of the council is good. I, I read the documents here, and uh, I don't see much wrong, maybe here or there. If someone handed you a glass of water and you knew that there was one drop of of poison in it, would you drink that glass of water? The Pope here is telling us, if there's one error, reject it. And as I said, I hope to be able to prove that Vatican II is filled with doctrinal errors. So remember that. Even one drop of poison taints the entire council. Also regarding the tone of Vatican II, something very apparent is ambiguity. And I've heard this, you have heard this, I'm sure, for years. Some people say, oh, Vatican II is good. Others say, no, it's not. How can you have these different views? It's because the documents themselves are ambiguous. And this leads me to my next point, that they are often contradictory. And I want to give you a couple examples of how you will have a document that will say one thing, and even in the same paragraph, it will contradict what it just said. And so that way you can take what you want. A modernist can take the council as a justification for promoting modernism, and a conservative will say, well, no, it says this. Vatican II would contradict itself. So here's a couple examples. This is on the use of Latin in the document on the liturgy. Particular law remaining in force, I'm quoting from the actual documents of Vatican II, the use of the Latin language is to be preserved in the Latin rites. But, since the use of the mother tongue, whether in the Mass, the administration of the sacraments, or other parts of the liturgy may frequently be of great advantage to the people, the limits of his employment may be extended. This extension will apply in the first place to the readings and directives and to some of the prayers and chants according to the regulations on the matter to be laid down separately in subsequent chapters. So it's saying... The, la the use of Latin is to be preserved. And then in the same paragraph, but the use of the mother tongue is to be extended, the vernacular. And of course, we know what has happened. Latin was so totally thrown out the window that seminarians who go to the modern seminaries over the last 40 years don't even take Latin as a subject. And so consequently, when Benedict XVI came out five years ago, and said, now I'm going to allow the John the Twenty-Third Missal to be used, and we'll call it the extraordinary form of the liturgy, etc. You had priests, Novus Ordo priests, who wanted to learn it, wanted to say the traditional Mass. They didn't really like all the modern things, but they didn't know Latin, so they had to go back and, and learn Latin or learn how to say the traditional Mass because Latin has been so totally uh, eliminated. Here's another example of contradiction right in the same document or in the same sentence. This is in, this regards common worship. 
something we call communicatio in sancris. Listen to the contradiction. As for common worship, however, it may not be regarded as a means to be used indiscriminately for the restoration of unity among Christians. Such worship depends chiefly on two principles. It should signify the unity of the church. It should provide a sharing in the means of grace. The fact that it should signify unity generally rules out common worship. Yet, the gaining of a needed grace sometimes recommends it. Now, someone please tell me what that means. I can tell you basically what it's saying is common worship isn't really a good thing. But then on the other hand, we need unity so it is a good thing. So again, Vatican II can be interpreted by conservatives as being against something that modernists are pushing. And then it can be also interpreted by progressives as supporting what they are doing. And I believe intentionally it is ambiguous and self-contradictory. Another aspect of Vatican II, the documents, is their wordiness, the verbiage. Some of them go on and on and on. Sixteen documents. And if you look at and read the canons of the Council of Trent, very concise, to the point, very clear. And when you enlarge a document and go on and on, it's easier to slip in error just because of the multitude of words in that document. And, uh, and that's what I see with Vatican II. Again, we talked about John the Twenty Third saying we're not going to have condemnations of error. We're just going to promote the true faith. Another aspect to the overall tone of Vatican II is what was omitted. Not so much what was taught, what was omitted. And Father spoke in the first conference on how there was an agreement. It was actually called the Rome-Moscow Alliance. There was a, an agreement between John the Twenty Third and Khrushchev that communism would not even be mentioned at the council. Now, I mentioned the official commission who sent letters, uh, inquiries to the bish bishops around the world saying, Please write back and tell us what you think needs to be brought up at the council. Overwhelmingly, the bishops of the world were asking for an explicit, clear condemnation of communism. Now, yes, Pope Pius XI had written an encyclical condemning atheistic communism. But the bishops of the world were saying a renewed condemnation would be very opportune because uh, Mao Zedong in China and uh, Khrushchev and Stalin, Lenin in Russia had murdered millions upon millions of people, especially Catholics, in cold blood. They were atheists. They were evil. And the whole movement is evil of communism. And so John the Twenty Third agrees with the communists that we will not allow it to be even brought up at the council. So Vatican II should be known more for what it did not do and what it did not mention more so than what it did mention. There were no condemnations of modernism, uh, other modern errors. The overall tone of the council was on the world. Modern man, human progress, things of this nature. Very different from any true council of the church. Now that's just talking about the overall tone. So now let's get into the specifics. I will give you seven errors of Vatican II, and I'm sure there are many more, but these are some of the main errors, as I said, even one of which would be sufficient to throw out the entire uh, proceedings as being that, those of a false counsel. The first is an erroneous conce concept of the church. Vatican II said, that the Church of Christ, meaning the Church founded by Jesus Christ, the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. What does that mean? It means it's in the Catholic Church, but it's also in the Anglican Church. It's in this Church. It's in that Church. Vatican II carefully refrained from saying the Church of Christ is the Catholic Church. Pope Pius XII defined that in his encyclical on the mystical body of Christ. Catholic Church, 
the church founded by Jesus Christ, they're the same thing. You math students can put an equation sign, an equation in between them, make an equation out of it, because they're the same thing. They are equal. But Vatican II said, no, they're not equal. The church founded by Christ is found in the Catholic Church, but it's also found elsewhere. And, of course, the reason for that was to lead to the ecumenism, which was one of the big things of Vatican II. Vatican II also taught, second point, that the Catholic Church needs continual reformation, as though it's somehow imperfect, as somehow Jesus Christ did not do a very good job when he founded the Catholic Church. We have to perfect it. We have to make it better. Let me quote to you exactly what the Council said. Christ summons the Church as she goes her pilgrim way to that continual reformation of which she always has need. That is absolute blasphemy. Let me repeat it again. Christ summons the Church as she goes her pilgrim way to that continual reformation of which she always has need insofar as she is an institution of men here on earth. Therefore, if the influence of events or of the times has led to deficiencies in conduct, in church discipline, or even in the formulation of doctrine, these should be appropriately rectified at the proper moment. And in this particular edition, the translator in his footnote says, it is remarkable indeed for an ecumenical council to admit the possible deficiency of previous defined doctrine. So the church needs a continual reformation of doctrine. What is that? Modernism, relativism. The doctrines were okay back then, but they need to be updated. As a matter of fact, Benedict XVI, and I don't remember whether this statement was made before his election or when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, but he made a, a very patronizing statement about Pope St. Pius X and Pope Pius IX. Pope Pius IX condemned liberalism, especially in the document known as the Syllabus of Errors, and Pope St. Pius X condemned modernism. And Ratzinger said, well, it was okay for them to do that back when they did. Because if they didn't, maybe people who wanted to change, they were being a little bit uh, over overreacting. So it was okay back then. But now times are different. And as I said, it sounds, when you read the exact quote, I wish I had it, sounds very patronizing, very belittling to these two great and holy popes. But it also conveys his modernist, relativistic ideas that even doctrine can change as time goes on and, and needs to change as time goes on. So again, our first error, an erroneous con concept of the church. The second, that the church has continual need of reformation even in its doctrinal definitions. Third, that false religions are a means of salvation. Vatican II taught that false religions are a means of salvation. And I will prove it to you by quoting the exact words of the Council. Quote, The brethren divided from us, meaning the members of other churches, other religions, they always called them the separated brethren at Vatican II, the brethren divided from us also carry out many of the sacred actions of the Christian religion, undoubtedly in ways that vary according to the conditions of each church or community. These actions can truly engender a life of grace and can be rightly described as capable of providing access to the community of salvation. So it's saying that the false religions themselves are means of salvation and means of grace. That's blasphemy. That's absolute heresy. Can you imagine Martin Luther who said blasphemous things about Christ and founded his own religion rebelling against the Catholic Church and then to turn around and say, but that religion that he founded, this apostate priest who rejected his vows, rejected the Catholic religion, started his own church, and that church is a means of grace, a means of salvation. Do you see how much of a problem, of a heresy this is? Now, we know that someone who is outside the visible bounds of the church can achieve salvation 
if he is in invincible ignorance, searching for the truth, but a false religion cannot be a means of attaining salvation. The false religion is not the vehicle of grace. It's that person cooperating with the grace of God with the actual graces that he or she has given. So you see the error here. Vatican II taught very clearly that false religions are vehicles of salvation. They are a means of achieving salvation, and that is heresy. Number four, and this is the biggie, religious liberty. In fact, many, many theologians, priests who have talked about Vatican II, they come down to this document as being the one that most clearly, unequivocally, is contradictory to the teachings of the Catholic Church. And that is the document on religious liberty. It was the last of the 16 documents to be promulgated. It was signed by Paul VI on December 7, 1965. And the next day was the closing ceremonies. So they, they put it off till the very end. And uh, Bishop Sanborn refers to the document on religious liberty as the kiss of death for Vatican II. Because more than any other document, it is so starkly in contrast to what the church taught before. Now, before I go into the error of religious liberty taught by Vatican II, we need to define two things. First of all, what do we mean by a right? Do you have rights? I have rights. They come from God. And our primary rights would be, first of all, you have the right to life. You have the right to own property. You have the right to get married, etc. We have certain God-given rights. What is a right? It is a moral power or a moral faculty that comes from God and therefore that binds others to respect it. So if you have a right to life, that means no one else can infringe on that right. Someone who attacks you and tries to take away your life is sinning, is violating a right from God. Someone who sneaks into your house and tries to take your possessions is violating your right to ownership because that's a right that comes from God. So we need to understand this because we live in an age when there is a, a cheapening of the word right. It's used for anything and everything. Animal rights, this person's rights, gay rights, everybody's rights, woman's right to choose. This is... Uh, a desecration of the word right. Those are not rights. Those are abuses of human free will to choose evil. You can't say that a woman has a right to an abortion. A woman has a right to destroy a child. That's saying that God gave her that faculty. So you see how the word right has been so... Uh, misunderstood, ho so demagogued, so destroyed. So a right is, is a power that comes from God. And we should not use that word for something that does not come from God. And the second concept to understand is what do we mean by liberty? Pope Leo XIII, that learned, brilliant pope and saintly pope of the latter part of the 19th century, wrote an encyclical called Libertas Humana, Human Liberty, and he said, don't call the abuse of free will liberty. In other words, if a person chooses to do something evil, you can't call that liberty because liberty is a dignified action. It is using a God-given faculty, namely your free will, to choose something good, something pleasing to God. And he said, but to use your free will to do something evil is not liberty, but license. So there's two different words there, liberty and license. So Vatican II is wrong on two counts because it says that every human being has a right to worship God however he chooses and that everyone is to be free to exercise that right, to have a liberty to exercise the right to worship God as he chooses. So, translation. Vatican II said, you have a right to be a Buddhist. If you want to be a Buddhist, you have a right to do that. And that right has to be respected by civil governments, by everyone else. 
You have a right to be a Hindu. You have a right to be a Muslim. You have a right to be a Jew, a Protestant, whatever, or nothing at all. That you have that right. Again, it's a desecration of the word because that's saying that God gave you that that ability to choose that and that we have to respect that. That power comes from God to choose that. You have a free will. And the Catholic Church has always taught that human beings cannot be forced. You can't take someone kicking and screaming and baptize them and say, good, I made a Catholic out of this person. Obviously, the Catholic Church has always taught that you have a free will and no one is to be forced to become a Catholic, to become a member of the Church. But Vatican II made this leap. It went from the concept of freedom from coercion to freedom to choose any religion. Now think about that. A negative idea to a positive. You're free from coercion. No one can force you to believe what God has revealed. You have a free will. If you want, you choose, you want to go to hell, you have a free will. So the Catholic Church has always taught you're free from coercion. The Vatican II distorted that idea, said everyone is free to choose whatever religion he wants. It reminds me, I remember when I was a little kid, I guess there was a campaign on in the 60s for this, but they had on the milk cartons, had like a picture of a church, and it said, uh, join the church of your choice. You ever, do you remember that? I remember pouring milk on my cereal in the morning and reading that. Join the church of your choice. Like, isn't that a wonderful thing? You can join the church of your choice. Wait a minute. What about God's choice? Aren't we supposed to join the religion of God's choice? I mean, after all, He's God. He has the right to reveal His truth. He has the right to found a, a church and to reveal truth. And there's only one church that He founded. So we have the duty to search to know what is the true religion. And we have the obligation to join that church. But Vatican II completely threw that idea out the window and said, you can choose whatever religion you want. And I'll quote here, this is taken from Patrick Henry Omler's book on, on the document on religious liberty. In Quanta Cura, December 8, 1864, which was an encyclical from Pope Pius IX, 100 years before Vatican II. In Quanta Cura, the supreme teacher, Pope Pius IX, declared, quote, and from this holy false idea of social organization, they do not fear to foster that erroneous opinion, especially fatal to the Catholic Church and to the salvation of souls called by our predecessor of recent memory, Pope Gregory XVI, insanity. Namely, that liberty of conscience and worship is the proper right of every man and should be proclaimed and asserted by law in every correctly established society. Unquote. So again, Pope Pius IX, a hundred years before Vatican II, quoted his predecessor to say this concept that you can choose any religion, that's insanity. Not only is it wrong, it's insane to say that man has a right to choose his religion. It's, it's unheard of. It, it's foolishness. It's a mockery of God. Now, to quote from Vatican II, the Synod, Vatican II is referring to itself, this Synod further declares, and now we are quoting directly from the document on religious liberty, this Synod further declares that the right to religious freedom has its foundation in the very dignity of the human person. This right of the human person to religious freedom is to be recognized by the constitutional law whereby society is governed. Thus, it has become a civil right. Uh, I won't quote more, but the document on religious liberty went on to expound this error, that every person has a right to choose his religion and everyone else must respect that as though it were a right from God. That is like dethroning God himself. That's like saying God is fighting against himself. God founds one church. Men, human beings inspired by the devil, found all these other religions, 
and then God gives you a right to choose which one you want? It just doesn't even make any sense. It's like saying, it's like God saying to you, okay, I'm over here, and Luther and Zwingli, all the other heretics are over there. Choose your side, and I'm giving you the right to choose, and I respect your choice. So Vatican II, both in this document on religious liberty and in the one I'm going to get to on ecumenism, is where we see modernism being put into practice. A couple of years ago, in our Fatima conference, we dedicated a couple of talks to modernism itself, to the encyclical of Pope St. Pius X and an explanation of what modernism is. And for those who were here, if you remember, modernism, the, the kernel of it, the, the, the source or the main faulty idea of modernism is that when God created us, he put in us a religious sentiment. And this religious sentiment expresses itself in different ways. According to the society, the culture in which you live, according to the circumstances in which you grow up, and consequently, every religion ultimately comes from that religious sentiment, and so therefore, the Holy Ghost is behind all the religions, Buddhism, the Islam, you know, all of these religions. That's what modernism teaches. As opposed to St. Paul, who said, faith cometh by hearing. Faith comes by hearing the truth taught. God reveals the truth, and his church teaches it. So modernists have been a completely different idea that faith comes from within. And we see that clearly in the document on religious liberty, which is absolutely heretical from Vatican II, and we see it in the document on ecumenism. So the next one I'll go into is ecumenism. And that is the idea that all religions are more or less good. Vatican II promoted common worship. As I talked about a little earlier and want to give you another quote from Vatican II on, this is addressing the Eastern Schismatic Churches, you know, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox, the various Schismatic Churches. Although these churches are separated from us, they possess true sacraments, above all by apostolic succession, the priesthood, and the Eucharist, whereby they are still joined to us in a very close relationship. Therefore, given suitable circumstances and the approval of church authority, some worship in common is not merely possible, but is recommended. And again, earlier I talked about how communicatio in sacris, common worship, was always condemned before. But now Vatican II is saying, you can do it. It's a good thing. So we have ecumenism that all religions are more or less good, and this leads to this idea of common joint worship. And we have seen the abominations of the gathering of religions at Assisi twice under John Paul II, and then last year under Benedict XVI. And Benedict XVI went his predecessor one step further he invited agnostics to come and join this meeting of religions at Assisi. But they had voodoo, they had practitioners of every religion under the sun gathering together to pray for world peace because modernists are ecumenists. They believe that all these different religions come from this sentiment from within, and therefore they are all good. And in fact, um, the uh, documents of Vatican II had a uh, statement on other religions, and this is in the Declaration on Non-Christian Religions, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, Shinto, all of these non-Christian religions that don't believe in Christ. And it went on to praise, I'll give you a little bit of it, from ancient times down to the present, there has existed among diverse peoples a certain perception of that hidden power which hovers over the course of things and over the events of human life. At times, indeed, recognition can be found of a supreme divinity and of a supreme father. And it goes on, Thus in Hinduism, men contemplate the divine mystery and express it through an unspent fruitfulness of myths and through searching philosophical inquiry. They seek release from the anguish of our condition through ascetical practices or deep meditation 
or a loving, trusting flight toward God. Doesn't that sound so you know, poetic, so beautiful? Buddhism, in its multiple forms, acknowledges the radical insufficiency of this shifting world. It teaches a path by which men in a devout and confident spirit can either reach a state of absolute freedom or attain supreme enlightenment by their own efforts or by higher assistance. Likewise, other religions, to be found everywhere, strive variously to answer the, relig- the restless searchings of the human heart by proposing ways by which, con- uh, which consist of teachings, rules of life, and sacred ceremonies. Then it goes on, the Catholic Church rejects nothing which is true and holy in these religions. Unbelievable. The Catholic religion rejects nothing which is true and holy in these religions. What are the things that are true and holy in Hinduism, Buddhism, etc., etc.? It goes on, uh, the church has this exhortation for her sons, prudently and lovingly, through dialogue and collaboration with the followers of other religions and in witness of Christian faith and life. Acknowledge, preserve, and promote the spiritual and moral goods found among these men, as well as the values in their society and culture. So one of the things we find going back to the document on the liturgy is it promoted what it calls adaptation. Since then, it's been referred to as enculturation. But adaptation means if a priest is a missionary in in India or Africa, and he's surrounded by some Hindus or Buddhists or the voodoo, uh, spiritists, etc., these different religions, incorporate some of their practices into the Mass, into your uh, your, uh, ceremonies to make them feel at home. And because we respect what is good and holy in these other religions. And so not only, besides the Novus Ordo itself, not only has the Catholic religion been desecrated by the adaptation of these false religions, but also the whole missionary movement of the Catholic Church has changed its focus entirely. And instead of trying to convert non-Catholics to the true church, now it's just simply to seek an understanding, to seek their social betterment, to have some dialogue, to come to a common agreement with them on certain things. Do you see what Vatican II did? It just completely changed the focus of the whole missionary concept, the whole idea of converting non-Catholics. The decree on the liturgy inaugurated a wholesale destruction of the liturgy. Vatican II said that we must go back to the earliest rites of the church. Go back as far as you can to the earliest liturgical books. And Pope Pius XII condemned that idea in his encyclical Mediator Dei. He said that is like saying, call it antiquarianism or archaism, that's like saying that the Holy Ghost has not been active in the church the last 1,500 years. We have to go back and find the earliest books that were written. But that was merely an excuse. Because on the one hand, while they said they wanted to go back to the earliest things, on the other hand, out of the other side of their mouth, they're saying we have to update the church and get up with modern times. So which is it? The ancient times or or the modern times? Anything that will help them destroy the faith. Another error of Vatican II, and this caused a number of the council fathers, bishops, and cardinals to be shocked and to... Uh, think that this is heresy. And they toned down the document on the church a little bit in this regard. Uh, I think it's in the document on the church in the modern world. But it's what is called collegiality. Now, collegiality means that the Pope is just the first among the bishops. It's kind of like the president of the, of the board. Instead of being the Pope up here, and all jurisdiction comes down from God through the Pope to the bishops underneath him, the hierarchical structure of the church, that the Pope is the vicar of Christ, the successor of St. Peter, now he's just another bishop. Yes, more honored than the other bishops, but just another bishop. So one of the things that Vatican II started were these bishops' synods, 
which they have every few years or so, I don't know what it is, every five years or whatever in Rome. So this idea of collegiality, that the bishops in their dioceses have more authority than they had before. Yeah, they're still supposed to be under Rome, but, you know, they have, they have a little more authority. Now, as someone has pointed out, a writer pointed out, I think it's a very interesting point. You know that the Freemasonic Revolution of 1789 in France had, as you might say, the battle cry, liberty, equality, fraternity. And this had to do with civil society. Vatican II did the exact same thing, used the same Freemasonic slogan at Vatican II, but applied it to religion. So now liberty, religious liberty. For, uh, equality, collegiality. And fraternity, ecumenism. And it's very interesting that those three concepts that the Freemasonic Revolution sought to, to apply in France in civil society have now been uh, applied to the church at large by Vatican II. So let me review where I find definite errors in Vatican II, the concept of the church that it's not equal to the church founded by Christ, but just part of it, that the church needs continual reformation, even in doctrinal definitions, that false religions are a means of salvation, that everyone has a right to choose his own religion, and we have to respect that right, we talked about collegiality, ecumenism, that all religions are good. We just have to try to understand one another better. And common worship, that we can get together with other religions and God is pleased with that common worship. Something called communicatio in sacris, something that was always condemned by the church, never allowed. And now Vatican II is not only allowing it, but promoting it. So I hope that I have demonstrated that Vatican II is the problem and the source for all the evil, the loss of vocations, the, the thousands, the millions of people that have left the Catholic Church, the Catholic religion, the nuns and priests that have left, the, all the, the scandals that have taken place, the loss of faith, the loss of souls. It's not because someone or some persons are misinterpreting Vatican II. The documents themselves are evil, are heretical, and are indeed from the devil. And the whole thing must be thrown out. Somehow, the modernists can't admit that. Benedict XVI keeps saying, we need to find out how there's, how there's here a, a hermeneutic of continuity with the past. Somehow we're going to find out. We haven't found it yet. In fact, a year ago, there was a letter written by theologians, a joint letter by theologians to Benedict XVI pleading with him to show how Vatican II is a con continuity of what the church taught before. As, as though they were saying, we, we don't see it, help us. And of course he can't. But he continues the same drumbeat. Vatican II is of God, it was good, we just need to apply it better. These poor blind souls. Let us thank God for the grace we have to see the truth. And let us try to lead others out of that darkness into the true faith as it was taught down through the centuries up until Vatican II and is still taught by true priests and bishops today. Thank you. God bless you.